Hephaestion, son of Amentor, was a Macedonian nobleman and a general in the army of Alexander the Great. He was by far the dearest of all the king's friends, he had been brought up with Alexander and shared all his secrets. This friendship lasted throughout their lives, and was compared, by others as well as themselves, to that of Achilles and Patroclus. His military career was distinguished. A member of Alexander the Great's personal bodyguard, he went on to command the companion cavalry and was entrusted with many other tasks throughout Alexander's ten-year campaign in Asia, including diplomatic missions, the bridging of major rivers, sieges and the foundation of new settlements. Besides being a soldier, engineer and diplomat he corresponded with the philosophers Aristotle and Xenocrates and actively supported Alexander in his attempts to integrate the Greeks and Persians. Alexander formally made him his second-in-command when he appointed him Chiliac of the Empire. Alexander also made him part of the royal family when he gave him as his bride Ripatis, sister to his own second wife Statera, both daughters of Darius III of Persia. When he died suddenly at Ecbatana around age 32, Alexander was overwhelmed with grief. He petitioned the oracle at SIWA to grant Hephaestion divine status and thus Hephaestion was honored as a divine hero. Hephaestion was cremated in Babylon in the presence of the entire army. At the time of his own death a mere eight months later, Alexander was still planning lasting monuments to Hephaestion's memory, youth and education. Hephaestion's exact age is not known. No concise biography has ever been written about him, likely stemming from the fact that he died before Alexander and none of those among Alexander's companions who survived him would have had a need to promote someone other than themselves. Many scholars cite Hephaestion's age as being similar to Alexander's so it is fair to assume that he was born about 356 BC. He is said to have become a page in 343 BC, a role common to adolescent boys of the aristocratic class in Macedon. As a member of the court, he may have met Alexander around this time. The only surviving anecdote from Hephaestion's youth comes courtesy of the Alexander Romance. According to this tale, one day when Alexander was 15 years old, sailing with Hephaestion, his friend, he easily reached Pisa, and he went off to stroll with Hephaestion. That Alexander's exact age is given provides another clue to Hephaestion's upbringing because at 15 Alexander and his companions were at Misa studying under Aristotle. Hephaestion has never been named among those who attended the lectures at Misa. But his close friendship with Alexander at that age suggests strongly that he was numbered among them. More telling is Hephaestion's name being found in a catalogue of Aristotle's correspondences. The letters themselves no longer exist, but for them to have found their way into an official catalogue, their content must have been of some significance. It implies that Hephaestion received a good education and shows that Aristotle was impressed enough by his pupil to send letters throughout Alexander's expanding empire to converse with him. A few years after the lectures at Misa, Hephaestion's presence was notably absent when several of Alexander's close friends were exiled as a result of the Pixodorus affair. Among those exiled by Philip II after Alexander's failed attempt to offer himself as groom to the Carian princess were Ptolemy, Nicas, Harpalus. Eridurius and Leo Medan. The reason for Hephaestion's absence from this list could be due to the fact that all of the exiled men were older friends of Alexander. Eridurius himself roughly 24 years older than the prince. Hephaestion was a contemporary of Alexander and it is likely that his influence might have been seen as less of a threat than these more mature companions. Whatever Hephaestion's opinion had been on the whole affair, like many of Alexander's other childhood companions he was not exiled in its aftermath. 
While it is true that very little detail of Hephaestion's childhood and education can be found, that which remains gives credence to what is known about his later life. His friendship with Alexander was long-lasting, as was his tenure in the court at Pella. He even shared the same education as the future great king of Greece and Asia. With such a promising start, Age and experience would have helped mold Ephesian Amentorus into the man who would one day be the second most powerful man in Alexander's empire, second only to the king himself. Career, sharing Alexander's upbringing, Hephaestion would have learned to fight and to ride well from an early age. His first taste of military action was probably the campaign against the Thracians while Alexander was regent followed by Philip II's Danube campaign and the Battle of Cheroni while he was still in his teens. His name is not mentioned in lists of high-ranking officers during the early battles of Alexander's Danube campaign or the invasion of Persia, nor are the names of Alexander's other close friends and contemporaries listed, suggesting that their promotions, when they achieved them, were earned by merit. Hephaestion's career was never solely a military one. Right from the start he was also engaged in special missions, sometimes diplomatic, sometimes technical. The first mention of his career in the sources is a diplomatic mission of some importance. After the Battle of Issues when Alexander was proceeding south down the Phoenician coast and had received the capitulation of Sidon, Hephaestion was authorized to appoint to the throne the Sidonian he considered most deserving of that high office. Hephaestion took local advice and chose a man, distantly related to the royal family, but his honesty had reduced him to working as a gardener. The man, Abdalonymus, had a successful royal career, fully justifying Hephaestion's choice. After the siege of Tyre Alexander entrusted his fleet to Ephesian, who had orders to skirt the coast and head for Gaza, their next objective. While Alexander himself led the army overland, Hephaestion's task was not an easy one for this was not the Athenian fleet with which Alexander had started and had earlier disbanded, but a motley collection of semi-reluctant allies of many nationalities who would need holding together with patience and strength. Furthermore, on arrival at Gaza the cargo of siege engines had to be unloaded, transported across difficult terrain and reassembled. Plutarch, while writing about Alexander's correspondence, reveals an occasion when Hephaestion was away on business and Alexander wrote to him. The subject matter suggests that this took place while they were in Egypt. What business Hephaestion was attending to we do not know, but Andrew Chug has suggested that it was concerned either with his command of the fleet or Athenian diplomacy. He quotes sources which suggest that Hephaestion had been approached by Aristian of Athens to effect a reconciliation between Alexander and Demosthenes and, certainly, Athens in action during the revolt of the Spartan king Agis would seem to support this idea. As Chug says, if he did persuade Alexander to reach an accommodation with Demosthenes at this critical juncture, as would seem likely from the circumstances. Then he was significantly responsible for saving the situation for Macedon in Greece by preventing the revolt of Agi spreading to Athens and her allies. It is likely, though not certain, that it was Hephaestion who led the advance army from Egypt to bridge the Euphrates River. Darius of Persia sent Masius to hold the opposite bank while the bridging work was in progress. This Masius was the commander who threw away what looked like certain victory on the Persian right at the Battle of Gogamla and later became Alexander's governor of Babylon. Robert Lane Fox has suggested that a conversation with Hephaestion may have won Masius over. It is conceivable that the Battle of Gogamla was partly won on the banks of the Euphrates and that Masius' reinstatement was less a sign of magnanimity than of a prearranged reward. It is at Gogamla that mention is first made of Hephaestion's rank. He is called the commander of the bodyguards. This is not the royal squadron whose duties also included guarding the king in battle and which was at that time commanded by Clytus, a man of the older generation, but a small, 
group of close companions specifically designated to fight alongside the king. Hephaestion was certainly in the thick of things with Alexander for Arian tells us he was wounded and Curtius specifically mentions that it was a spear wound in the arm. After Gogamla there is the first indication that Alexander intended reconciliation with the Persians and that Hephaestion supported him in this unpopular policy. One evening in Babylon Alexander noticed a high-born woman obliged to dance as part of the entertainment. Curtius explains, the following day, he instructed Hephaestion to have all the prisoners brought to the royal quarters and there he verified the lineage of each of them. Alexander had realized that people from noble families were being treated with little dignity and wanted to do something about it. That he chose Hephaestion to help him shows that he could rely on Hephaestion's tact and sympathy. Yet Alexander could also rely on Hephaestion for firmness and resolve. When his policies had led to a plot against his life, the possible involvement of a senior officer, Philotas, caused much concern. It was Hephaestion, along with Craterus and Coenus, who insisted on, and actually carried out, the customary torture. After the execution of Philotas, Hephaestion was appointed joint commander, with Clytus, of the companion cavalry, Philotas' former position. This dual appointment was a way of satisfying two divergent shades of opinion now hardening throughout the army. One, like Hephaestion, broadly supportive of Alexander's policy of integration, and the other, that of Philip's older veterans in particular, whose implacable resentment of Persian ways was well represented by Clytus. The cavalry prospered under this command, showing itself equal to learning new tactics necessary against Scythian nomads and to counter insurgency measures such as those deployed in the spring of 328 BC. The army set out from Bork in five columns to spread through the valleys between the Oxus and Tanais rivers to pacify Sogdian. Hephaestion commanded one of the columns and, after arriving at Marikanda, he set out again to establish settlements in the region. In spring 327 BC the army headed into India and Alexander divided his forces. He led his section north into the Swat Valley, while Hephaestion and Perdiccas took a sizable contingent through the Khyber Pass. Hephaestion's orders were to take over either by force or agreement all places on their march and upon reaching the Indus to make suitable preparations for crossing. They were in unknown territory whose political and geographical landscapes were unfamiliar, and Hephaestion would have had to make decisions on the spot and act accordingly. He reached the Indus with the land behind him conquered, including the successful siege of Pusiolatius, which took 30 days, and proceeded to organize the construction of boats for the crossing. Alexander often had to divide his forces and command was given to a variety of senior officers on different occasions. For example, a few weeks before this mission of Hephaestians, Craterus had been sent with a large force to subdue the last two remaining Bactrian rebels. It seems that Hephaestion was chosen when the objectives were far from clear-cut, and Alexander needed a commander on whom he could rely to do what he would have done himself without needing instructions. Hephaestion took part in a notable cavalry charge at the Battle of the Hydaspes River. Then when the army began its homeward journey he was again entrusted with half the army, including the elite troops and 200 elephants, as they traveled southwest along the banks of the Hydaspes. Some of the army, including Alexander himself, traveled in boats which had been provided by the sponsorship of leading courtiers. Arian lists Hephaestion first among these honorary triarchs, indicating his leading position at this time. On entering hostile territory Alexander split his forces into three. Hephaestion's section marched five days in advance, with the object of intercepting and capturing any native troops which might be rapidly moving forward. Again, Hephaestion was called upon when initiative was required. After Alexander had taken a detour to subdue a hostile tribe, in which he was seriously injured, Hephaestion took command of the greater part of the army as they traveled down the Indus to the sea. 
At the coast he organized the construction of a fortress and a harbor for the fleet at Patalar. Hephaestion was in command at Patalar while Alexander advanced. When he rejoined Alexander at Rhombasia he established a city there also. Hephaestion crossed the Gedrosian desert with Alexander, sharing the torments of that journey and, when the army was safely back in Susa, he was decorated for bravery. He was to take part in no further fighting, he had only months to live, but, having ended his military career as Alexander's de facto second in command, he was also his second in the political sphere. Alexander had made that official by naming him Chiliac. Photius mentions Perdiccas being appointed.